All right, so for those of you who've been following this series, you'll know that what we're trying to do is to set the background or answer the question of what did it, what did that sign mean that they put above Jesus' head on the cross? So when it says the King of the Jews, what did that mean? And so we've spent a lot of time so far in this series. It's been the longest series I've done so far, and it certainly will be um, by the time it's finished. What I'm trying to do is to set the whole background for the life of Jesus for the Gospels. As I said last week, you probably know a lot about the story of Jesus anyway through various sources. Um, And so I don't want to spend a lot of time so much on that as opposed to looking at how that story came about. What is the background to that story? So, um, you know, who were these Pharisees that we've that we we encounter in the New Testament. Um, what are the just just what is the general situation of uh, Judea and of Galilee when Jesus was alive? So yeah, just something of a background or the sort of the broader context of what was actually happening uh, in in the gospel accounts. And so one of the sort of key narratives that has been going through this whole story so far has been the story of empires. And so we've actually seen the rise and fall so far of a number of different empires, beginning with the Assyrians, uh, followed by the Babylonians, uh, and then after that came the Persians, and then finally we met the Greek Empire. Um, and what we've started, what I've started to allude to so far is the presence of the Romans. So by the time you get to the Gospels and the entire New Testament, we've got a world that is under the occupation of the Roman Empire. And this is the biggest empire that has happened so far. Really, this has been a story of increasingly large empires around the Mediterranean. And so by the time we get to the Roman Empire, we've actually got an empire that spans the entire Mediterranean. So unprecedented in its time. Uh, and that really was the empire. And it, it's an empire that lasts for a thousand years. It's an extraordinary um, feat of, of empire. And so it's to understand the story of Jesus or the whole New Testament, you have to understand who these Romans are, where they've come from, what, the, what these guys are about. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to get to a bit of the background of, of an understanding of, of who the Romans were. But to sort of, sort of lay the groundwork for that, particularly as it relates to uh, to Israel. So the the point of this whole story has been how has uh, the how has sort of the the nation of Israel and and the Jewish people how have they been impacted by all of their surrounding circumstances? Israel was always a postage stamp geographically in the context of the Middle East, and so really they were they they really were buffeted by whatever was going on around them. So whatever empires were in control at that time was going to have an immediate impact on the Jewish people and on the nation of Israel. And so that story is true throughout all of this, and it's no less true for the Romans. So I want to look at how the Romans came to be in control of the Jewish people and, and of, of that region of Galilee and what is uh, and Judea. But to sort of get there, we have to understand a little bit about who the Romans were and where they came from. So we're going to come to that, but I want to pick up from where we left off last week. Where we where we sort of got to was the sort of the beginning of the end of the Greek Empire. So Alexander had established his empire. Um, he'd taken over the previous Persian Empire. That his generals that had then divided that up because there was no clear succession plan as to who was going to take over the empire after Alex- Alexander's death. And what eventually happened was that there was two, the two biggest parts of what became the Hellenistic world. They were the Seleucid Empire sort of in the northern part of Israel over sort of to the, to the north uh, east of Israel. So what, what was effectively previously the Persian Empire had become the Seleucid Empire. But then to their south and into the west was Egypt, so the Ptolemaic Empire. And unfortunately, geographically, Jerusalem fell right between these two empires. And so as these two were com- constantly competing for power, um, Jerusalem was like the meat in the sandwich between these two warring factions. And so they were constantly buffered between the two and really their political fortunes were completely dependent on the outcomes of whatever these two empires were going to do. So the real turning point came in 167 BC when Antiochus IV, who was the king of the Seleucid Empire, came in and had um, effectively um, sort of taken control of uh, of Jerusalem, but was ruling it through his high priest, a guy by the name of Menelaus, who had actually just bought the position. Um, the, the position of high priest was so 
far from what it used to be with just the Levi. It's been uh, through through family line and through succession becoming the high priest. Now it was really just, it goes to the highest bidder. And so Menelaus was the high priest because he paid the most, the biggest bribe for that role. And really what that means is that he's a puppet for Antiochus. He, Antiochus has got his man in control. And what that means is that he's going to be the one to guarantee the peace and to help collect the tribute. So that really becomes what the role of the high priest now is. There's no king anymore. Um, that's all been done away with. The high priest has effectively taken over as the leadership or as the ruling role of the people of God. So that's where we sort of found ourselves. Um, Antiochus um, had uh, sort of attempted to suppress the Jewish people um, through a failed conquest into Egypt. He'd come back and sort of exacted revenge on the Jewish people. He had um, effectively suppressed all of their religious practices, circumcision, Torah, Sabbath, kosher, all of these things. He'd suppressed those, made them illegal, and at the same time had set up a statue of Zeus, which he believed himself to be the manifestation of, set up a a statue of Zeus in the temple itself and was offering pigs and making sacrifices to Zeus in the Holy of Holies, in God's temples. I mean, this was just the worst possible desecration that one could ever imagine. And so what that had led to was an uprising amongst amongst the Jews, led particularly by a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus. And so he's led a guerrilla campaign, which after a couple of years, years has effectively driven the Greeks out of Jerusalem, had had taken control of of the temple and of Jerusalem back into the hands of the Jewish people. And so then subsequently had cleansed the temple, which led to um, what became the annual tradition of, of Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights. And so what that began was maybe certainly in the minds of the Jewish people, a restoration of being the people of God. Um, the point of being the people of God was that you have your own land, you rule in Jerusalem, God's temple is, is or Yahweh's temple um, is devoted, of course, to him. Um, all of those things needed to be restored and put back in place in order for the Jewish people to sort of be able to say, well, God has restored us because at the moment we are back in the land, but we're, we're paying tribute to live here to these pagan kings who call themselves gods and it's all just a mess. So there seemed to be something of a a beginning of a restoration. Now, the takeover wasn't immediate. It still took about 20 years for the Jewish people to really establish themselves as having autonomous rule. And that took place in the year 142 BC. So about 20 years after, or a bit over 20 years after the initial um, sort of expulsion of the Greeks out of Jerusalem. In 142, Simon, the brother of Judas, um, was declared to be the ruler and the high priest of the Jewish people, which was extraordinarily problematic in that the king was always meant to be separate from the high priest. And that was always the point. You're never supposed to have the two roles together because if you've got a king who's also the the mouthpiece of God on earth, that's a recipe for tyranny. That's never going to happen. And so to combine these roles was very problematic. Nevertheless, he was declared to be this. He was sort of put into this position as um, both the ruler and the high priest until such time as a true prophet should arise. So there's still an expectation. There's still an awaiting uh, a return of a prophet who's going to restore the people fully. But in the meantime, we've at least got a Jewish king who's going to take on both of these roles. And importantly, what we've got is autonomous rule. And that's really what we've been striving for this whole time, to be able to say that we are self-governing. We are back in control of our own destiny. And most importantly, we've thrown off to one degree or another the uh, the, the the influence or, or the leadership of the Greeks, and so one of the sort of um, carry or what characterizes Simon's rule is that he effectively throws off the yoke of the Greeks. Um, it's it, the the Greeks come to realize that they're not going to get tribute from the Jewish people anymore. He, he's, he declares that we're not going to pay you tribute anymore. Um, we are in control of ourselves again. So this is a this is something of a good turning point. But it's not the same. It's not how it should be. Again, he's the king, but he's also the high priest. And really, in in so many ways, he doesn't change the culture. And this is what becomes the problem for his successors, what becomes the Hasmonean Hasmonean dynasty. Um, They don't really 
sort of push back against the, the biggest problem, which has been the, incur- in the encroachment of this Hellenistic culture. And that was really what was so, um, so, pre- so prevalent or so pervasive about this Greek ruling is that it wasn't just that they were Greek overlords who demanded taxes and demanded peace. They really enforced culture as well and 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 their gods and just everything that was antithetical to being Jewish. And so that didn't really change under these Has- Hasmonean rulers. They just basically continued on this this sort of Greek influence. And for many of the Jewish people, they they happily embraced it because there was still a recognition that everyone around them is still under Greek rule. And so if you want to have any sort of connection with that bigger ruling power, you need to have something of a Greek understanding. So this Hellenism didn't really stop with these new kings. So that we're not really even close to where we should be in the sense of being fully restored to being the people of God. Now, what sort of happens after Simon, he, there's a series of successes that come after him. And what these successes do is really just expand the territory of uh, of the Jewish people. So they, they branch out from Jerusalem and sort of ostensibly the idea is to um, bring the sort of surrounding Jewish people, the Jewish people sort of living outside of Jerusalem or uh, in different parts of the region around them, but they are a minority group in what is largely a pagan world. And so what the uh, successes of Simon do is to continue to expand the territory of this of their rule so as to bring sort of security and protection for those Jewish minorities. And so they kind of, as they expand, they take on more territory, but in doing that, they're also bringing into their own orbit the people groups of the land that they're taking. And so amongst these, one of the regions that they take is an area called Idumea, which uh, the one of the chief or one of the, the main clan chiefs of that uh, area is a guy by the name of Antipater, who's the father of Herod, who's going to become Herod the Great. So we'll pick up his story next week. So that's sort of, they all sort of come into that Jewish orbit. Um, there is, there's some forced conversion. If you're going to be part of the, this territory now, part of the people of God, you're going to be the people of God. And so there's forced conversion in, in some areas, such as in the case of, of Herod the Great's father. Um, but generally what there is is just an expansion then of the territory and, and the authority or, or the ruling of these, of these Jewish kings. Now, some of the downsides of this as well, as a part of that expansion, when they go up into the area of Samaria, if you remember Samaria had sort of been set up um, after the Assyrian conquest, and they kind of developed their own form of Judaism. Well, as a part of this uh, Hasmonean conquest, they go into the area of Samaria and actually destroy the temple on Mount Gerizim. Uh, And so that's destroyed and the Samaritan people naturally are enraged by this fact. And so we can still see that anger seething when we get to the Gospels, where you've got, um, obviously, the Jews and the Samaritans are, seem to be mortal enemies. Well, in some part, that's because of what the Jews had done to them during that sort of expansion, having destroyed this temple on their holy site, which was which was Mount Gerizim. So there's, go, there's, there's all of these factors at work. But the biggest concern is the one we've been talking about is the continuation of Hellenism. That doesn't stop. Um, the ruling elites are still very Greek in the way that they think they're what we might just call secular. They're, you know, as opposed to being very faithful Christians who are really devoted to living a life according to scriptures and pleasing to God, these people, you know, we, we sort of categorize anything that's the opposite to that as somewhat more secular or maybe even pagan. That's what we're talking about in a sense with the way that these, these rulers are still very much Hellenistic in the way that they carry themselves. And so it's in a response, it's in response to this, the particularly under uh, Jonathan, who, who sort of takes over immediately from Judas Maccabeus, and so it's um, it's Simon who who takes off takes over after Jonathan. It's during the rule of of Jonathan, these early days of the Hasmonean dynasty, that we see the rise of these um, these alternative groups, these um, these alternative religious, effectively pressure groups, who are coming growing sort of. Emerging in response to this increased Hellenism, what they were, what they were, particularly when we come to the Pharisees, was the alternative to that ruling class. That ruling class is is 
very Hellenistic, they're, they're pagan, they're corrupt, they're all of these things. We've got a king who's also the high priest. All of it is a mess. So we're just going to go and create our own alternative over here. We're not going to sort of toe the line with these rulers. We're going to basically be um, an opposition to them, culturally at least, in trying to sort of restore something of the dignity of the people of God, bring it back into um, prop a proper understanding of Judaism. And so what these different groups really are, are different philosophical groups. They they all agree that as Jewish people, they need to live according to scripture. They need to live according to Torah. So that's that's God's, not just his law for right and wrong, but it's a whole way of life that we've talked about. And so the debate really comes down to how do we faithfully live this out? We went wrong in the, in the first place. That's why we went to exile. And so now in this new world, how do we live faithfully according to Torah in order to live a life that is most pleasing to Yahweh? And so what happens as a result of this are different groups emerge that have their own sort of idea of how to do this. And so there are three sort of key groups or three main groups that emerge in this period two of them we meet in the new we, we see in the new testament and so we've already talked about the pharisees but the other group that we come across are the sadducees so we'll talk about both of those groups but there's a third group as well that don't get mentioned in the gospels but have become more well known um, since the discovery of the dead sea scrolls which is the essenes so they're sort of a, another alternative group um, all trying to do the same thing all trying to live according to scripture according to Torah, but in their, in their own understandings, in their own different ways of doing this. So the first group we'll look at are the Sadducees. We actually don't know as much that much about them, primarily because they didn't really write much. They didn't, they, they sort of, well, basically their whole idea was that we just live um, to the bare minimum degree according to Torah itself. So we have Torah, we have scripture, we don't need anything else apart from that. And so we just do our best to live according to that. And, and that's all there is. So they don't, you don't have a lot of writings from the Sadducees. You don't have a lot of their teachings because they're more of a, they're more of a political group. Um, they're not so much uh, a, a strict religious group as they are sort of political pragmatists. They're Jewish leaders who are, you know, to some extent ostensibly living according to Torah, but really only to the degree that they can have a maybe a facade, a perception of being righteous or, or living according to Torah, but still allowing enough space for their own political and economic interests to be to be fulfilled. So the little that we do know about their particular beliefs, we, we actually learn from the Gospels and then later on from Acts. One of the things we know about the Sadducees is that they rejected um, any belief in angels and they rejected any belief in a resurrection. They just simply didn't believe in that. Once you die, that's it. There's no resurrection. Now, the Part of the reason for that is probably pragmatic as well, because if there is a resurrection, and in the Jewish understanding, the resurrection is a day of judgment. God will come back and judge his own people and judge those uh, around as, as to their faithfulness, as to you know how how have they uh, sort of lived according to to his laws. If that's a if that's the case, if there is a, a day of judgment, a, a resurrection, that's not going to end well for the Sadducees because really they haven't done it that well. So maybe it's just easier not to believe in it. Maybe it's just easier not to worry about all of this eternal spiritual stuff. Let's just focus in on the here and now because again, the what we where we find these Sadducees is primarily within the political ruling class. In fact, um, all of the priestly roles tended to be filled by the Sadducees. They were really just the wealthy elite ruling class um, who sort of put it, again, put in on this facade of Torah obedience, but really more their interests lay more with um, their power, with their wealth, with, with being in charge. And at the same time, what we what we know of them is that they were very sympathetic to Hellenism. They again, you, you imagine somebody who is very much in the world um, with sort of a facade of, of of religiosity, just enough to you know maybe be seen to be religious, but really more pragmatically, they are kind of a product of, of the culture of the world in which they in which they live. And so that really is what the Sadducees 
tend to be. Um, but nevertheless, they're important because they do fill those priestly roles and they do have, uh, they really hold all of the positions of political power and influence. And so that's sort of something of an understanding of, of who those guys are. But at the same time, it's why we don't see Jesus having much to do with them in regard to debate or um, any sort of um, theological discussion, because that really wasn't their priority. Where we see that happening, where we see Jesus having the most debate is with the Pharisees. And so we see him having this debate with them because, again, they they were the ones who were really adamant about f- fulfilling Torah. And so they have, they have a lot to say about it. They, they write a lot. They have a lot of oral traditions, um, which are their, their ways of interpreting scripture so as to live according to Torah in the most faithful possible way. So the word itself, so the Pharisees themselves, the word Pharisee, the word literally taught, literally means separate or, or set apart. So the name itself kind of tells you their, their whole attitude because they are separatists. They are trying to separate themselves from the current world order, from, from the ruling elites. They want to be seen to be different from them, and so they set themselves apart from them so as to, um, to to sort of set a different example, to show a different way of doing Judaism. And so that becomes their priority. To try and, their interpretation of Judaism is, is quite unique. And again, it's that that Jesus is opposing. When they, when they have questions and arguments with Jesus, it's about interpretations of the law. Well, we interpret the law to mean this and, and do it this particular way. You do it a different way. Or, or, or how would you do it, Jesus? And so that's where these sort of theological debates come in later on in the life of Jesus. Now, they're, they're a relatively small group. Um, Josephus is probably our primary source for who they are, and he estimates their numbers to be about 6,000. So it's not a great deal. And when you consider that they are an educated class, they, they are trained in the law, well, to do that, you can't just be a fisherman. You, you can't be uh, a farmer or, or just an everyday, you know, what we might call a blue collared worker, somebody who's having to work for a living from the youngest age working in the family business. That doesn't afford you the opportunity to do the amount of training that is required to become a Pharisee in the first place. So they are elite in the sense that they're wealthy and educated, which the wealth has allowed them to have that education. And so that's going to constrain their numbers. But at the same time, they're, they're, they're sort of um, – their, their influence by being wealthy and elite and educated sort of outsizes their actual n- numbers in, in reality. So then what, what characterizes them is the opposite then to the Sadducees, which is opposition to Hellenism. That's really what is driving them. It's this increasing incursion of, of Hellenism within, particularly within Jerusalem, that they're that they're opposing. They're trying to lead something of a revolution back against this cultural influence that's been happening because they remember remember what happened last time. They know the scriptures. They know that the last time we absorbed all of the cultural preferences of, of from around us, we went into exile. And so they're they're pushing back against that as their as their primary driver. And so what they do then is that they take the law, but then they interpret it into just rules upon rules and laws upon laws and traditions upon traditions so as to ensure that they don't violate any of the commands. So you've got a simple command of keeping the Sabbath, which can break into hundreds of laws and traditions about the specific things that you can and cannot do on the Sabbath so as to remain uh, or so as not to be a Sabbath breaker. And so again, when we come to Jesus later on and the debates that he's having, a lot of the debate that Jesus has is with their traditions. It's not with they all agree on the law, but what Jesus is responding to, pushing back against, are their, the multitude of their traditions, which are essentially losing the sight of the law. It's kind of, you, you can't see the forest for the trees. And so Jesus is trying to sort of push back against those multitudes of, of interpretations that he sees as just being a, a burden. You, these, these massive weights of responsibility you're trying to put on the people when the laws are really simple, 10 simple rules that you've turned into hundreds of rules. So that's where Jesus' issue largely lies with them uh, later on. Now, within uh, Phariseeism itself, there were two key branches. Um, two very prominent teachers emerged from the school of the Pharisees, one by the name of Hillel and the other one by the name of Shammai. 
Now, these men, um, they taught in the second half of the second century BC. So we're talking, sorry, of the, of the first century BC. So we're talking about, some, you know, sort of like 50 BC to zero, around about this period. Now, there were sort of different generations, but within that, uh, within that sort of half century. And they have very different perspectives on how to live out being the people of God and what it really boiled down to and, and really what was at the heart of all of this um, this, this sort of political um, pressure or this political sort of separatism that they were pr- pr- practicing was the idea that Yahweh is going to return and when he does, he's going to be the one to expel the, the pagans. He's the one who's going, only Yahweh can restore the people of God and Israel back to what it was, back to the original plan. He's the one to do that. But the the debate sort of came down to how do we bring that about? And so on the one hand, you've got the Hillelites whose idea was basically God will do it in his own time. We just need to be faithful until that day comes. So sit back, don't force your hand, don't you know, don't cause any trouble unnecessarily. God will do what he wants when he wants. And what we need to do is remain faithful until that day comes. Now, one of the most uh, famous teachers of, or one of the famous descendants of Hillel was a guy by the name of Gamaliel. So the grandson of Hillel is Gamaliel. And for those of you know who know your New Testaments, you'll know Gamaliel because he's the one who turns up in, in Acts and he's actually the teacher of Saul, of who becomes Paul later on. So he's a very famous teacher and um, sort of has a very outsized amount of influence within the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of, of the Jewish people. Um, on the other hand, however, you've got Shemei, and his idea is much more of a, much more activist, much more, you know, God moves when we move. And so his basic idea is based, well, it's really based out of the, the tradition of, of Phinehas. So going back to Numbers 25, Phinehas was one of the servants of Moses. And when they were out in the desert, you had a whole bunch of these guys going off and marrying these Canaanite women. And so his response is to go and kill them, right? And Phinehas was just like, you know what, we're going to slaughter these guys because they're trying to defile the, the, the people of God. And so he was praised for that. And, and the Shamaites sort of come along later on and go, that's kind of our inspiration for how we're going to bring about the the, the redemption of, of Israel. We need to take up arms and go out there and do it ourselves. And so they sort of have this idea of, or have this sort of um, approach of being zealots. They are the ones who are really just going out and actively pursuing the, the restoration of God's people, which is where we get where Saul kind of gets his motivation from, which is interesting because Saul, Saul is trained by uh, by Hillel, by Gamaliel, a Hillelite, but becomes ultimately a Shammaiite. And so him persecuting the Christians is in this sort of idea, this sort of school of, of the Shammaiites, which is God moves when we move. So take up arms, drive out the pagans and and do it by by sword if, if, if that's what it's going to take. So those are our Pharisees. And the other group that I mentioned that we don't find in the New Testament but are very important in this time are the Essenes. Now, the Essenes are much more like a, a monastic group, right? They, are, they, they see Jerusalem itself as the problem. The problem isn't just certain, the rulers of Jerusalem. It's the whole city. It's, it's everybody in it. The whole thing is completely corrupted. And so the only way that we're going to... Um, to be holy, the only way we're going to um, truly be the people of God is just to get the hell out of here. And so they go up into a, a whole set of caves and we've, in, the, in Qumran, and so the whole Dead Sea Scrolls and all of that. Their whole idea is we just need to get away from these the, the sons of the, the sons of the devil, right? The sons of darkness to go and be truly the sons of light. And so they they sort of create these monastic communities and very strict communities as well. Some, some of the branches of this Essene community were completely celibate, so absolutely no sex whatsoever, and so therefore no, no second generation, but very much strictly communal life. So everything is shared in common. And so, and very strict even in the sense of purity. That was their big big concern, being pure, being, um, being clean. Uh, and we've already talked a lot about ritual purity. For them, these guys, they were incredibly serious about it to the point where some of them would not even defecate on the Sabbath, not even go to the toilet, and, you know, do, 
defecate on Sabbath because that might defile them. So extremely, extremely devoted groups, small groups focused on maintaining their purity so that when Yahweh returns when the when the day of when um, the the day of judgment comes, they will be found to be the ones who are the most holy. They they are the ones to, to be found who are the most faithful. So that's something of them. Again, they don't really play into our New Testaments, but they are an important sort of um, working behind the scenes in, in our New Testament context. Now, the last development that that has sort of happens during this period, and it's one that is becomes prominent through our New Testaments, is the Sanhedrin. So, so what is this? What is the Sanhedrin? Jesus stands before the Sanhedrin for his trial, and we see again later on Paul standing before them as well. So what is this Sanhedrin? Well, what they beca- what they were was the ruling body of the people of God. So if you remember with the way that these, um, uh, the, these empires work themselves, um, very minimal, minimal bureaucracy. So pay the taxes, keep the peace, and everything's going to be okay. And for the most part, they're happy for the locals to look after themselves, to have their own ruling bodies, to have their own kings, whatever is required for you to um, just to keep order amongst the people. We're happy for that to happen so long as you, as the ruling body, make sure that taxes are collected and the peace is kept. So in the case of the Jewish people, in the case of Jerusalem and its surrounding regions, that responsibility falls to the Sanhedrin. Now, what the Sanhedrin were in, there were, there was several expressions of it. There was the greater Sanhedrin, which is the one that was found in Jerusalem. And then there were lesser Sanhedrins found in all the major cities, all the major Jewish cities within the region. And so the, think about the lesser Sanhedrins as sort of local district courts, and then the greater Sanhedrin in Jerusalem as the Supreme Court or as the High Court. So any appeals or anything that couldn't be dealt with at that local level gets elevated up to the greater Sanhedrin. So the greater Sanhedrin, they have 70 members and the high priest who presides over them. So 71 members in total in the same way that if you remember when Moses was overwhelmed by all of the responsibility that he had, and then his father-in-law comes and he says, what are you doing? You're trying to, you're trying to do it all. Um, you need to distribute some of this responsibility. And so he appoints 70 elders to help to adjudicate all of the multitude of problems that is going on in the Jewish community. Uh, and so he, you've got the 70 elders that he appoints plus Moses. Well, in the same way, this is now replicated in the Sanhedrin with the 70 members plus the high priest. And so that then becomes the ruling body. And so it's through this that the Greeks, later the Romans, are able to do to, to take care of or, or to manage um, the people, because they sort of be, act, act as something of the bridge or the the go between between the people and their actual bosses, which are the Greeks, and then and then later on the Romans. So the members of these, as you would remember, um, consist of both Sadducees and Pharisees, and so they ultimately are then the 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 ruling class. They're 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 the ruling body then um, of of the people of uh, of Jerusalem and, and of the surrounding regions. All right, so that's with that established, that's something of a the, the, some of the sort of um, the cultural or the or the, at least the political uh, and religious setting that we find later on in in the Gospels in the New Testaments, and something of an explanation then of what we find Jesus engaged with and, and in some cases responding to. But the really big picture that we need to finish off, and this is where we'll sort of we are getting towards Jesus himself, but this is the last piece of the puzzle now that we need to fill in in order to really sort of get the full scenery of of, of the life of Jesus within the Gospels. And that is of course the Romans. So who were the Romans? Well by the time we meet them in the New Testament, they are the ruling empire of the entire Mediterranean. They are the superpower of that part of the world. And really the next nearest empire is sort of the Parthian Empire right down in the east, which is sort of on the furthest ex- extent of what used to be Alexander's Empire. And then beyond that is the Chinese Empire. So these are the main empire that's and they surround the Mediterranean and so naturally um, the, the you know, Jerusalem and uh, everything related to that falls under their purview as do all of the diaspora Jews so everybody all of the Jews who have been scattered throughout 
what used to be the Persian and then the Greek empires, that's all now having come under Roman rule. So again, who were the Romans? Well, again, we we think of them as this massive empire. That's what we sort of, they come into our stories. But like any of these empires that we've met, they all have small beginnings. So the story of Rome actually goes back to the city of Rome. We think about Rome and we think about the empire. Rome was a city like it is today, and it's still in the same place. Rome itself began as a city. Uh, And so what becomes this great empire actually really just started as a village. Um, the, the whole sort of founding story, we don't, we won't have time to go into, but the founding of Rome goes back to two men, two brothers, in fact, by the name of Romulus and Remus. So the date of this is about 750 BC, which is about the same time as the, the Greek world really started to emerge as well. But around 750, um, these two brothers, Romulus and Remus. Now, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you might note the um, the the little play on the names here that J.K. Rowling does in in the last in the last book in in the Deathly Hallows. So, if you remember Remus Lupin, um, well, during he, when he appears on Potter Watch on that sort of uh, renegade radio program that they establish, he goes under the name of Romulus. So, a little bit of a play on Roman history there, just for any Harry Potter fans. Anyway. So 750, Romulus and Remus, um, they're deciding over where they're going to found this new city and they have an argument about it. Romulus kills Remus and so now he becomes the sole ruler of what is going to become this this new village, which is going to be named after himself, which is which is Rome. Now, in the early years, there isn't really much going for Rome. It's just Romulus. And in order to have a village, you need people. Well, there are no people really to start with because they've already got their own villages and they've got their own um, sort of, they've, they've got their own families and groups that they're already attached to. So what the sort of people that the city initially attracts are just troublemakers, people that just don't fit in to their villages or they're, they're exiled or they've, they've been punished and so they've been exiled. Basically, everybody who's a troublemaker, everybody who is just bad news in their own towns and villages all end up in Rome and so become the nucleus of what this new village will be. So already the, the starting point of Rome is just a bunch of men who are misfits, who just nobody else wants to hang around with. That becomes the, the starting point of what becomes Rome later on. But nevertheless, they kind of continue to grow and and, and, and expand as, as a village. And for the, at least the first 250 years, they're ruled by a king, which is a pretty standard practice. Everywhere you look around this world, you're always dealing with kings. Well, for, that's working fine for about 250 years until in about 500 BC when the, when the last king, a guy by the name of Tarquin the Proud, um, he is effectively a tyrant. His sons are even worse than he is and they just cross the line. They do too many things that just that, uh, frustrate or just um, enrage the people and so they're driven out. They're driven into exile and in response, what, what the Romans do now that they've got rid of their king, they decide that we need a new type of government, a, a government that is not going to um, be succumb to the whims of a tyrant like the one that we just had. We need to come up with something that's a little bit more democratic, something that's a little bit more, at least it, it separates the powers and so they come up with what they call a republic and what that effectively is is that the elite men, all of the, uh, I guess, the advisors and all of the wealthy men that were around Tarquin the Proud, they take the power into themselves and form a senate. So about 100 what we would call patricians, they become the ruling body of Rome and out of them every two years are elected two consuls, two leaders for that year and they hold power for one for one whole year. And so every year is named after these two consuls. But the idea of only giving them one year to rule means that even if they're both terrible, they're going to be gone in a year and we can replace them with two other people. So that's a sort of a, a bit of a check and a balance for maintaining something or at least avoiding a tyranny. And by having two as well, what it means is that we don't ever have just one person in control. So two people have to both agree on whatever the best course of action is. And so what that guarantees is there's something, again, of a, of a balance of power so that not one single person can just take control for themselves. Now, it's an entirely different story 
as to how later on it becomes an empire with an emperor, that's all sort of around Julius Caesar. We can maybe do that in another series. But that's at least the plan for the moment. And so for the next five, basically 450 years, that's effectively how Rome is, is ruled. It's ruled by a senate with these two consuls who their role for that year is to manage the city, manage to manage Rome, and, and then whatever is required along with that role. Well, anyway, that's, that's all fine and well. But also remember what we've been talking about is that this is a world where in springtime kings go off to war. This is just what the world does. So every spring you go off, you, you have a military campaign to the village down the road and you get as much spoils as you can. You come back home for the harvest and you've brought back whatever spoils you've got. And so even the men that are fighting are going to be the farmers who have just, well, it's... We've, we've done our sewing for the, we're just waiting for the harvest. So we take whatever weapons we can afford and you always buy your own military gear. You don't, uh, that's not provided for you. So whatever you can afford to fight with, you take that along to this skirmish and then whatever you can take from whoever you vanquish, well, that that's what you get to keep for yourself. So that's generally how warfare works. And so for the Romans, they're just doing what everybody else does. The difference is that the Romans are really, really good at this. They're really, really good at the whole warfare thing. And, well, there's a couple of things that really characterize Rome, and this is what really characterizes or what sort of leads to their success. A couple of characteristics. Number one is that the Romans are very organized, incredibly organized, and really what helps them to maintain the, the armies, the large armies they have and the large empire they have is a very good organizational structure. So they do the organization thing really well, and so that enables them just to be efficient. That enables them to be very effective in whatever it is that they're doing. So that's a key characteristic that they carries through throughout their the course of their history but the other thing that characterizes them is that they're plagiarists um, they don't have an original idea so really everything about rome is just an adaption of all of their surrounding community of all of the surrounding societies if they come across something they see as being good they just take it for themselves and they latinize it and they just make it their own and then you know over time sort of adapt it to their own uses, perfect it, and then incorporate that into their own ways of doing things. And as time goes on, if they find a better system, then they incorporate that. So even when we talk about crucifixions, we think about crucifixion as being something that the Romans did. No, they stole it from somebody else. Um, the, the swords that Romans used, the, what in, in the Latin, the gladius, um, well, they took that from the Spanish. They fought the Spanish. They liked the way that their little short swords were far more effective than their big long swords. And so they adapted that for themselves. In fact, the word gladiator comes from the word gladius, which is which just means a sword. So they just adopted that for themselves. And the third thing that characterizes the Romans is that they just don't give up. Right? They, they, will, they refuse to lose. So they can go out and campaign one year, and if they get beaten by whoever they're campaigning against, you can guarantee that they'll go back home, and they've lost a lot of their men, they'll go back home, they'll raise up another army, they'll be there the next year and the next year and the next year until they beat the people that they've been fighting against. So Rome loses, but they never lose. They never give up. They will, have, they will keep coming back until they vanquish you. And so the longer it takes, the more frustrated they get, but nevertheless they're always going to win. And so what that means is that over time, the Roman, um, the Rome's occupational expansion continues throughout um, the entire Italian peninsula. For the next couple of hundred years, they gradually expand until all of Italy, the what is now Italy, is under Roman control. Now, Rome itself is still its own city-state, and all of the other city-states are their own, were, were autonomous, but now they all come under Roman rule. Now, one of the other things that they do during these conquests, rather than say, we're going to take all your gold and turn all of you into slaves, they beat them, and then they say, look, all right, carry on as you are, you know, just, just pretend we were never here, but... Whenever we go to war, if we ever declare war, we expect that you guys are going to provide men for us to fight with. That's the condition. So we won't take all your gold. We won't take everyone into slavery. We'll let you carry on as you are, but you are obligated to provide for us military forces whenever we call on that. And so what that effectively creates for then for the Romans is an increasingly large military force. And at the, at the same time, these villages that they've conquered cannot declare war on somebody else without Roman 
permission. So Rome, the, the, the Rome controls them in the sense that whatever they want to do outside of themselves, that has to be done now via the Romans. So this enables them to ultimately conquer the Italian peninsula and at the same time build for themselves a very large military force that is going to, as time continues, become an increasing threat to the rest of um, to the rest of the Mediterranean. Well, anyway, just a couple of quick key moments then as this empire expands, because no, remember we said before that there's no king over Rome, so there's not one Alexander the Great who's saying I'm the king of Macedonia until I die, and so during my lifetime I want to expand the Macedonian Empire and take down the Persians. You don't get that. What you've got is every year you have consuls in control of the government, but after a year they have to step down and then somebody else replaces them. So you don't have this long-term ruler who has these great ambitions to, to go and conquer the world. What happens instead, and the, the way that Rome eventually comes to take control, is that as their power increases, they're seen to be a threat to surrounding regions. And in doing that, they sort of it sort of draws them into conflict. It's not like the Romans back away from them. They kind of look for the conflict, but it sort of creates opportunities for the consuls for that year to say, oh, look, this region over here is a bit of a threat, so we need to go and remove the threat. We need to go and um, maybe put down what could be a potential army or, or something like that, and so go and destroy them, go and do that, and so that way we're going to eliminate that possibility. And so what they'll do is that they'll get a general and then they'll raise an army. So the, the army is always meant to be loyal to the consul, but then they'll appoint a general and they'll say to that general, okay, go out and fight this campaign, do, do whatever this thing is. Now, one of the big turning points that happens is um, their other major rival within the region is in, in, in North Africa in a place called Carthage. And here again is where we sort of see that, pla that plagiarism come into effect. Carthage is the other major empire in the western part of uh, of, of the Mediterranean. So they rule through North Africa, but then up into Spain. And what makes them so successful is that they've got a great navy. They're, they're a naval force. Um, the Romans aren't. The Romans are a ground force. They're an army. They, they, don't, they haven't been on the ocean yet. In fact, a lot of Romans are just scared to swim. So they don't have a navy. They don't understand how to do naval warfare because they haven't had to at this point. Well, anyway, through a series of sort of, um, through a series of issues, they come into conflict with the Carthaginians. And the turning point for the Romans was that they actually find a Carthaginian ship. The Carthaginians built fantastic naval ships. And so the Romans find one in basically it's been abandoned, but in basically perfect condition. And what they discover is that the Carthaginians, what makes them so successful or so efficient is that they effectively create flat pack ships. Now think about Ikea flat packs where you've just got all of the pieces pre-cut and they're all marked where, you know, a mark, this mark connects to the, the, uh, the same mark in another part of the boat so that they can be very easily put together. So what the Romans do is they go, this is great. So they pull the whole thing apart, reverse engineer it, and then figure out how it all works and then go and build a whole lot of them for themselves. But the thing that they do that is kind of the Roman addition to it is that they put a drawbridge on it. So they've got these great naval boats that can carry their armies, but they're not a navy. They're, they're still a, an army. They're a land force. So what they do is they put, put these great big uh, drawbridges on the, on the edge of the boat and they sail up next to the Carthaginian ship, drop the, the drawbridge down, which has big hooks, spikes on the end to hook into the opposite boat. Then they send their, their men over and then they slaughter everybody in the boat. Now they're fighting on their own terms, which is with sword in hand. So as a result of that, they eventually bring down the Carthaginian Empire. Well, that's done. And so now they're controlling the western part of the Mediterranean. Well, over in the east, you've got this, still got the Greek Empire. Well, those guys are in decline because they're constantly at civil war. And what tends to be happening is that the... Greek kings in the different parts of the Hellenistic world are constantly calling on the Romans to come and support them in their own battles against these opposing Greek kings. And so we saw an example of this with Antiochus last week, where he calls on one Roman senator to come over as a representative of Rome to stand against Antiochus IV. Well, what that represents, of course, is these 
increasingly powerful Roman forces that he re- Antiochus realized that's not something I want to go against. And so he turns tail and, and goes home. But what that sort of gives opportunity for the Romans to do is to increase their um, expansion into the Greek world, not by going in and just conquering the Greeks, but effectively by being invited in. And so as time goes on, eventually they're continually being invited in until they eventually go, well, you know what, we're just going to take this for ourselves. And so they, they go in and they take uh, Macedonia and then eventually they take all of the Greek mainland. And so now Greece itself is now under Roman control. So that takes us up to about 146 BC. And then finally in 133, the king of Pergamum, a guy by the name of Attalus, he realizes that, okay, Rome is in control of the western part of the Mediterranean. They're now in control of Greece. Now the Asian peninsula, um, which used to be the Persian Empire, that it's only a matter of time before the Romans just come over and, and take control. Um, it's, it's, it's only going to be a matter of time before that, that happens. The writing is on the wall. And so rather than sort of succumb to the inevitable, which is that all of the people of Pergamon will eventually be slaughtered by Roman forces, they he, he says, all right, Rome, the city's yours. Pergamon, I leave it to you in my will. And so they they don't even have to fight anyone in Asia. They've got a permanent foothold now in Asia in the form of Pergamum, just given to them, literally given to them on a silver platter. And so this gives them then a starting point now into Asia, into, well, what is soon going to become Israel. And what it also means is that this is the sort of the beginning now of the end of the Greek world, of the Greek empire. Now, just before we finish, there's just one more element to this story that I want to finish with, and then we can unpack this in some more detail next week. When we talk about the world of the first century, um, we talk about it as a Greco-Roman world. So I've asked, I posed the question before, why is it that you've got a Latin-speaking Roman uh empire, Roman rule, Latin speaking, but the New Testament is written in Greek. Why is it that Paul speaks Greek? Why is it that Jesus as a second language would have spoken Greek rather than Latin? Why is it that when Rome came in and took over, that everything stayed Greek? Well, because as I said before, the Romans are plagiarists. They just adopted everything that they liked about all of these other cultures, really created, apart from creating concrete, and um, the arch, there wasn't a lot more that the Romans really did. They just took everything and just translated it into Latin. So what we get is what we call a Greco-Roman world. The Romans militarily were superior. The Romans were in control in the sense politically, they, they ruled the Mediterranean, but culturally everything remained Greek. Greek education, Greek philosophy, Greek oratory, Greek language, Greek ideas, Greek gods. In fact, a lot of the Greek gods were brought back to Rome and just given Latin names. They just said, oh, we, we, you've got such a developed theology, such a developed pantheon of gods. Why reinvent the wheel? Let's just bring all of them back to Rome and just give them Latin names. And so the gods of Rome and the gods of Greece are effectively the same thing, just with Latin or Greek names, depending on where you find yourself worshiping that particular God. So the, the kind of, there's a bit of a, uh, not so much a joke, but really more of a, uh, something of a summary of what happened when Rome came into the Greek world. Uh, the, the, basic, the same basically goes that Rome conquered Greece or Rome conquered um, the conquered, but the conquered conquered the conquerors. I hope that makes sense. Rome conquered Greece, but really culturally, Greece conquered Rome. And so really the Greek world as we know it remained as it is, hence the New Testament still written in Greek. And so many of these Greek ideas really remain within the culture. The only difference is now rather than paying our taxes to Greek kings, we're now just paying it to a Roman emperor. That's really all that's changed here. And rather than having Greek forces who are keeping the peace, now it's just Roman forces keeping the peace. But really apart from that, not a whole lot has changed. So we're talking about a Greco-Roman world here. Greek in culture, but Roman politically, Roman in the sense of its taxes and its government systems. But apart from that, again, everything else, very much Greek. All right, so that kind of brings us up to, well, 
almost to Jesus in the sense that we've, we've got a Roman Empire now in the region and really it's just a matter of the dominoes falling and what we're going to see next week is the way that these dominoes fall to the point where, um, well ultimately where we see Jesus being born into this Roman world. But there's a few things to sort of fill in the details of that story before we get to that point and we're going to cover that next week. But anyway, um, I hope you have a great week. I look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, all the best. I'll see you then.